Manisha Ghosh is uh, currently a research professor at uh, Chicago, uh, and uh, she has been a former FCC CTO, and she has more than 25, 24 years of experience in the telecommunications industry. She's going to have a fireside chat with Brian, and Brian Hendricks is our VP of uh, is VP of Policy and Public Affairs. Brian has, is responsible for regulatory legisl legislative policy and developments impacting technology and innovation. So without further delay, we will start the fireside chat and let's see how the virtual and physical world works today where Monisha is here, is in person and Brian is there or there in, uh, in the virtual world. Can you see Brian? Oh, okay, okay, otherwise I can... Yes, 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 absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, we, we can, can um, as, as a social, social we are going to maintain the social distance on the stage. We take out the mask if the distance is, yeah, yeah, so absolutely. absolutely. So I will let communicate with Brian. And uh, Brian, over to you. Thanks, uh, Ashish. Thanks, Munisha, for doing this. And I apologize that I could not be there physically in person with everything that's happening in Washington. It will make for a, an interesting fireside chat since one of us is fireside and one of us is not. But I um, want to thank everybody for coming. And uh, just to kick it off before we, we get into some of the interesting policy issues, I wanted to talk a little bit about AI at the network level and how we're using it in our products. Um, you know, artificial intelligence applications in the context of the network use algorithms a lot to look for patterns in, in the data. Uh, those patterns can help the operators predict network abnormalities and provide fixes before they actually even become issues for the customer. So it's simply put detection and automated response. It's a major development for network optimization and performance, but it obviously also holds some fairly important promise um, for, for security applications because of the speed with which you can detect, um, you know, issues with the network uh, anomalies and, and deploy automated response and adjustments in the network in, in a faster way. Uh, we have launched our own machine learning based AVA platform uh, to better manage everything from the capacity planning to predict service degradations on cell sites, often at least a week in advance, which you can imagine is an extremely uh, important and valuable tool for our customers. And overall, you know, operators are, are using data-driven insights to monitor the state of their equipment, anticipate failures, and proactively fix problems on everything from the hardware and the towers, the power lines, data servers, uh, and even set top boxes in consumers' premises. Um, we're anticipating that that AI machine learning is going to be driven even deeper into the network at every level during 6G um, to achieve the faster rates and the lower latency uh, and, and more beneficial performance gains that we think will be necessary to realize 6G. Uh, we will really need that. We're going to have an a network that is environmentally aware and capable of making dynamic uh, allocations of resources, changing traffic flow and processing signals down to the level of being able to determine, uh, given the environmental conditions around, given the, the, the things that are happening on the network, which power mode, which waveform, which spectrum band will be necessary to optimize the performance of the radio. So you can see that using large amounts of data to, to be predictive, analytical, and responsive uh, is already in play in 5G and is going to be a critical part of, of being um, uh, deeper into the fabric of the, of the 6G network design. So I'm gonna kick it over to you, Ashish, having talked about the, the network use of AI to, to hear from Manisha. Yeah, directly, uh, Manisha, if you, you can give some insights, that would be that would be great. Sure, thanks, Brian. And uh, Brian did an excellent job of summarizing the different areas where AI is uh, becoming increasingly important in telecom. Uh, my personal research area is very much on the actual air link part. And over the last few years, I've personally started using AI uh, in a bunch of areas. And uh, just picking up on what the previous speaker, Jason, said about, you know, the three things that really propelled AI in image recognition uh, with the compute power, um, the algorithms, and the availability of data. 
I think the first two we can leverage as a community, you know, the compute power we can use, the algorithms, there's plenty out there and more being developed. In my mind, what's, what is limiting us today is the access to data. And I'm speaking as an academic researcher mostly when I say this, but it is really, really hard for people who are uh, researching this field. If you're not within one of the few companies that have access to data, is how do you get access to data? Uh, and I feel as a community, unless and until we address that problem head on, we create the equivalent of ImageNet for wireless, um, we will not make the kind of rapid progress that other fields have made, which have access to data. So even in healthcare, and um, uh, in a past life, I used to work in Phillips Research, and I spent a little bit of time on AI for healthcare, uh, and this was almost 10 years ago, the access to data was limited, and that limited us. And it was only when um, you know big hospitals and big research centers started sharing data that you started seeing the advances move in that field. Uh, at this point in wireless, we are at a stage where there's a lot of promise, uh, but what's holding us back is uh, having a methodology, what data is needed. Not every problem needs the same kind of data. Some problems, you want the RFIQ sample data. For others, maybe you just want coverage data. Where is signal available? What is the signal strength? Um, so even identifying the needs of different applications, it's very ad hoc. Uh, uh, the researchers, they just, um, you know, figure out what it is they need. Either they try to collect the data themselves, which is a lot of what I do, um, or you try and approach companies. The other piece I think we should think about carefully, and uh, Brian alluded to it when he brought up this whole notion that now your radio is not fixed. You could be choosing waveforms, you could be choosing power, uh, depending on network conditions, depending on environment. And that from the FCC perspective, and you know, we've had these discussions within the FCC when I was there, is how do you certify such devices? Uh, it's very easy to certify a piece of hardware. You know it's fixed, you know what the filter response is, you can measure out of band, in band, all of those parameters, and they do not change. If now suddenly you have a network composed of devices that can adapt to their environment, how do we make sure that the, the rules of the spectrum are still maintained? And how does the FCC certify those devices for use? So that's a big problem, which I think we should start thinking about. The final point before we take it off to a conversation I'd like to point out is, um, there are a lot of similarities between using AI in wireless, uh, as say compared to images, but there are also differences. And uh, I think we need to keep those in mind as we are looking forward uh, in developing new algorithms. Uh, for example, a lot of the huge gains that AI has made is in fields where human, where the benchmark is how well humans do, right? Even a two-year-old can recognize cats in different environments. It's hard for an algorithm to do that, and there's a lot of work being done into it. In wireless, I mean, if you show me a signal at trace and you ask me, are there two uh, access points transmitting this a time domain signal, or three, or three, I can't tell you. I don't have any native affinity to a wireless signal, and most humans don't. It is something we created, we manipulate, and now we are trying to apply AI to, to do it better. So um, we can use a lot of the techniques. Uh, there'll be a lot of approaches where you take these wireless signals and kind of map them into images. So you create a transformation, take them into 2D, look at it as an image, and then use image processing algorithms on it. Uh, but I think there is also room to go back and look at our native problem, uh, which is a bit different than the image processing problem and see if we can do things differently there. Yeah, I mean that is that is that is an excellent point. I mean, I I'm listening for the first time that in telecommunications we have this uh, this major uh, data uh, issue that you pointed out. So, Brian, do you want to uh, 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 highlight what could be done at the government and the policies, or or do you want to highlight any other aspect or comment on what Munisha said? So, well, first of all, I want to co-sign everything she said about the access to data being critical. And I think we have within the context of large data, 
uh, data collection, data storage, data handling. We have a huge social anxiety in the United States uh, elsewhere too, but particularly in the United States around this. And we have to understand the origin of how people think about collection of data and what the understanding of both the general public and of policymakers is about where that data is collected, who's collecting it, and why it's being used. For example, uh, a lot of folks have thought about big data and analytics being something that's a platform and edge-based approach. I don't think folks have really taken the time to, to think about the importance of this information in developing uh, the next generation of telecommunications infrastructure or how network networks operate. And there are debates that go on all the time, including you know, a couple of years ago when we had a, a data privacy order come out of the uh, FCC, which treated the data addressed and handled by broadband providers differently than it did the edge. And that reflects a pretty basic misunderstanding about the importance of data to everyone. Um, so we have to be cautious, but we also have to understand that there is an unease about the collection of this information. And it's not just because people watched, you know, Terminator movies and saw Skynet and AI and got a bad feeling about it. It's that the idea that a lot of your activities, even if anonymized, uh, have information uh, being collected and, and utilized is is un unnerving for some people. And that is expressed routinely in polling and public surveys that are are made aware uh, and available to policymakers who are also aware that there's a a negative attitude towards big tech whether you include network uh, equipment makers along with platform companies uh, but that information certainly resonates with policymakers and so the first thing we want to do is make sure that we don't have an impulse to jump in here and say well this is new, it's anxiety provoking, therefore we need to regulate it a lot. Um, I think the issues that Manisha raised around availability are the important ones. And we have to understand a little bit about why that information may not be more robustly available. Is it uh, competitiveness concerns that companies that do have access to the information don't want to make it available? Is it concerns about liability because without sort of a baseline uh, privacy uh, framework in the United States the way we have in other parts of the world. It's unclear uh, what happens if you collect and handle and store data. And if we understand th those anxieties, perhaps there's a way that we can fashion a role for, for policymakers in trying to create trust in the general public around data, maybe facilitating the development of baseline uh, best practices and standards for collection and anonymization, perhaps even cultivating public data sets that could be made available to qualified researchers who meet you know, standards for training and, um, and awareness for handling of data. Um, those are roles that, that could be very powerful and persuasive uh, in, in driving the debate without the need for regulation. And then of course, there's always the role for additional funding um, to, to drive the foundational research it needs themselves. So I guess I would be curious from the standpoint of Monisha, um, how she feels about what I just said in terms of the public trust, roles the government might be able to have in creating more trust, creating an environment to facilitate sharing with some, some guideposts, and maybe talk a little bit about um, in terms of where the United States ecosystem is relative to the rest of the world, are we behind? Are there areas we're leading? And what are the places where we can we can drive more research uh, dollars and support from the government? Yeah, thanks, Brian. So uh, I spent some time at the National Science Foundation as well, uh, where we were managing, where I was uh, uh, part of the team that managed the wireless research portfolio. Um, and uh, we, within that NSF, uh, which funds most of the academic research in this country, it, this was, you know, starting four or five years ago, it became quickly apparent that um, from a researcher's perspective, we were, you know, NSF funds a lot of platforms. And some of you may have heard of platforms for advanced wireless research with a hardware platform. And it's pretty clear now that uh, data is, should be viewed as, as infrastructure, as a platform. If we want academic researchers to start working on machine learning for wireless, we have to create the infrastructure for them to have access to data. Uh, so there are initiatives within NSF uh, working with uh, researchers. So there are 
quite a few of us who actually do a lot of data collection on our own for our individual research areas, uh, but we try to make that available to whoever wants it. But that is not enough. I think the data that everybody really wants is the data that the operators have, and that is the hardest to get. Uh, and I think a big part of that is competitive advantage. Uh, they do not want to share that data. Uh, however, I think um, if you look at healthcare, which you would agree that your healthcare data probably uh, contains a lot more private information about you that can be used to harm you in real ways um, than you know what movie we're watching. I mean, maybe maybe some people don't want uh, others to know what movie they're watching too. But and they have figured it out. So there are ways. There are. Uh, methods like differential privacy that allow you to release subsets of data. Uh, NSF conducted a workshop specifically around the topic of how federal agencies that collect a lot of data, so IRS, for example, FCC, uh, NTIA, um, other agencies, uh, they collect a lot of data, which is um, which can be you put to much greater use than the agencies are doing themselves. So what are some of the best practices that these agencies can develop uh, to allow access to academics? So that conversation has started. In the Biden administration, he, I think, stood up an AI task force too to look more deeply into the, and this is not just wireless data, it is all data, but, uh, and I think people in government still are not thinking about wireless data in the same terms. Uh, but this is the right time to start those conversations. And companies like Nokia, who have, you know, government liaisons, uh, I think uh, having that word go into the federal agencies that, yes, we see this as important, would definitely help move the needle forward. In terms of competitiveness in this field, I honestly feel that, uh, I mean, I don't want to be chauvinistic here, but I think the U.S. is still the leader. And if it isn't, it is because of this lack of access to data. If we can just, I think, if we can address that problem better, uh, ImageNet started in the US, all of this explosion that happened in AI started in the US, and to keep that momentum going in the US and just steer it more towards wireless and telecom, uh, it, it has to be sort of a broader community where companies, government, academics all work together uh, to solve this problem. Yeah. Um, and, I, I think if you put your minds to it, there are ways that you can address this issue of sharing data without compromising privacy or security. So let me just ask a, a quiet, maybe make a statement and ask a question because the the sort of asymmetric nature, it seems to me, of information availability for research and product development purposes, or at least what I perceive to be an asymmetry between you know, some of the platform companies and the network. Some of that's just a misunderstanding, I think, about the level of innovation that's happening in the network and with equipment developers and the role of AI. But it seems to me that um, the talent attraction into the field uh, is going to follow the um, you know, that data access. If we don't have robust access to drive innovation and research, then it's going to be harder to attract top end talent into uh, to this space and to the telecom space as opposed to, you know, the the world of the platform companies. Do you agree with that sentiment that this is a sort of an unseen issue that you know, we'll benefit from another area where we'll benefit from having more robust access to information about what's happening on networks. Absolutely. Um, I'm actually going to, uh, going to start a new position at the University of Notre Dame in the electrical engineering department in January. Uh, and one of the problems that EE departments across the country face now is that they're losing the best students to data science and the computer science departments. Um, and to be able to attract some of these, uh, you know, young minds back into wireless, uh, we have to position, you know, wireless as an area where you, where you too can use data science. Today, data science is all about, or mostly about, you know, 
how you can sell things more or about finance or about image recognition and positioning the telecom and wireless as a space where there are a lot of exciting things to do with data science, uh, with AI and ML is absolutely important. And, you know, as we are reworking some of uh, how we position ourselves, um, this whole concept that, yes, please come to WE departments. You will have to learn a little bit of the hardware, but there is a lot of uh, applications of machine learning here that are actually extremely exciting. Uh, because even some of you know the, the few uh, pieces of work that I've seen where uh, AI has been used to understand uh, you know your physical channel or your environment um, is is very very exciting, and it can lead to future policy. So. I don't know how much time we have. Oh, we have uh, around one minute. So I think okay. uh, we are all yeah, there. So I just wanted to give you one small example of some recent work that uh, we've been doing where we're trying to understand uh, whether a device like a phone uh, is indoors or outdoors uh, without the use of cameras, without, but by just looking at what signals we are seeing on the phone. GPS doesn't work indoors, so it doesn't work very well. But then if you look at the plethora of RF interfaces you have on a device, all of the signals, you know, you have FM signals, you have 900 megahertz ISM, you have 2.45 cellular bands. Um, and then we, we collected a lot of data and we were surprised as to how easy it was actually to use off-the-shelf algorithms. So the magic was not in the algorithms, it wasn't in the compute, it was in the right getting the right data for the right problem. And now if you extrapolate it forward as we're looking at spectrum and spectrum sharing and how to do a better job of managing your spectrum, this kind of data, this kind of applications become increasingly important. Thank you. Thank you, Manisha. I mean, uh, you and Brian can go on and uh, and then we will learn throughout the day. I think and it's, it's this time, 20 minutes is not justified, but I think we'll have to close here. Unless, Brian, you have a quick uh, 30 seconds comment uh, to make uh, and we will, um, you know, pause here for the next event. So thank uh, you very much. Thank you. Absolutely. Yeah, thank you. Ashish. Absolutely.